You know what that music means, folks. It means that, well, despite the best efforts of the Disinformation Project and Rebecca Kitteridge and the fact that I knit and I may have walked past someone with braided red hair this week, Free Free Speech Fridays is back on the platform. And joining us today for our half-hour session uh, from the Backbencher Pub, Gastro Pub, is Alistair Boyce, commonly known as Boise, who has become a contributing writer to the platform. Boise, how are you, mate? I'm very good, and I'm very happy that you accept my work. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, we don't pay it. Pay for it. That's yeah, you another don't have thing. To pay me. All right. And also joining us, a man who is one of the, well, one of the standard bearers for free speech uh, in this country. I know that um, you, dear listeners, uh, love listening to him and what he has to say. He is um, the guy at the sharp end of the the stick or the spear on free speech, Jonathan Ayling from the Free Speech Union. Jonathan, how are you? Morning, team. It's uh, good to sit down with you. Great, thanks. All right. Um, Alistair, have you met Jonathan? I'm not sure. We had the Free Speech um, Union in the other Friday at the backbencher doing... um, Recording they were things. good enough to let us do some filming there for uh, the documentary we're going to be releasing early next year following Jacob and Shangama around the country. Yeah. So uh, we had some of the iconic uh, faces looking down on us for that conversation. Yeah, he was great the other day, uh, Jacob, and, and he's up on uh, our website. We've had thousands of people listen to the discussion I had with him on, on, on free speech. Um, well, guys, it's good that we can still do this. I-, I wondered at times in the last week whether or not it wouldn't be outlawed, saying things that might be controversial on, on the radio. And we saw on, I think it was Tuesday, this web, or, or sorry, last Tuesday, the Web of Chaos documentary, which was Kate Hanna from the Disinformation Project and a bunch uh, of other Wokies, including David Farrier, describing the danger signs of extremism and the sort of speech that maybe we should be controlling. Uh, have either of you seen the documentary? No, I, I haven't. Watch it. I've heard about it. Yeah. Jonathan? Well, look, Sean, as we toured around the country last week with Jacob, it came up a lot as we sat down with academics and media and politicians. And I I just, I'm baffled, to be honest, at this fixation that is emerging. It's almost this compulsive fixation on speech that we've seen uh, I, I don't know, maybe I've had my head in the sand, but it seems like really very recently this has emerged where th- there are a, a really a handful of people that are pushing this um, perspective of, of speech being the essence of the thing we need to break up. And, and I, I don't see how it can end well for us. Mm. Uh, Boise, uh, are you feeling that down at the pub? Have you got guys monitoring what people are saying at the backbencher, being as close uh, you are to the po- to the political centre of power? I'll be quite honest. We just sort of um, crack up laughing in the face of it. Um, <laughs> so we throw off about it at the bar and ask if you're listening and say where are the cameras. And uh, um, No, I find it pathetic. I'm uh, pretty much over this uh, wokeism of... Um, Everyone being scared of words and what you're saying. We we all need to express our our points and our words, um, and that was exemplified. Chris Trotter, what an amazing interview! Um, oh yeah, that was this week with us. I don't know if you heard that, Jonathan. Chris Trotter came out and said to me, "I'm not voting Labor or Greens. This is a government with totalitarian tendencies." Well, and this is where we have this um, phrase that's emerged: liberal authoritarians, and. I'm not sure who coined that, but it's an absolute oxymoron. The, the, the two are supposed to be totally exclusive, but, but we see them trying to have the faith of liberal progressive values and yet cracking down like no one's business. Yeah. Uh, uh, Boise, that was amazing what Trotter said, eh? Because he's, you know, he's like, if it was the 1930s, he'd be going off to fight in Spain, wouldn't he? Absolutely. Now, um, it was riveting. I had to listen to it twice. Um, so when I was at university pretending to be a... Oh, well, I joined the new Labour Party when I was at university. That's how left I was. Okay. And Chris Trotter was sort of a hero, and he has been all the way through of the left. 
Um, and he's rational, and his, his commentary is, is superb. And for him to be that offended, to say the, the things that he did about this government, and they were true. You might have noticed in my articles, I've been yeah. saying dangerously close to totalitarianism. Yeah. I've got a, I don't know if you're aware, but I, I've got a political economy degree, a political science degree. Oh, and, that explains um, so much of, of how boorish <laughs> you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I've been really concerned all the way since the occupation protest um, and b before that when they did the mandates and I was appalled when the mandates came out we had 90% um, of people that already complied with taking the vaccination um, the, this government, uh, uh, the most appalling government uh, in, in, in this regard of totalitarian behaviour and authoritarian behaviour, and it's totally unnecessary. I mean, it's it's only there to push through their agendas and try and get a, a climate, and unfortunately it's a climate of fear. It's awful. Um, and that was absolutely exemplified by Chris Trotter and his historical analysis, and, and the dangers of it are absolutely huge. But what they're doing is turning the whole country against them. I think it's turned now, and there's no way people are going to trust the government of this ilk. Um, and it's time they, they went, it really yeah, is. Well, guys, I've got to say, I think we saw a change in strategy uh, ahead of that shocking poll result Friday night, or shocking if you're a Labor Party supporter. And the Labor Party had their uh, annual conference up in Auckland over the weekend, and I think we saw a change in message away from, oh, let's hunt Nazis, you're all white supremacists, um, to... We are the party of the working class, that great line, we are the party of the smoko room, not the Koru lounge. Uh, and now this week, though we've exposed it this morning as largely window dressing, big banks bad, we're going to stop them making billions, we're for the little guy. That would seem to me to suggest, Jonathan, that the government's internal polling does suggest that it realises it is has run out of sympathy on the free speech, hate speech uh, rhetoric, and it's trying to refine a, a different strategy to get back next year. Well, well, uh, any of us surprised by that? It, it, look, let's be honest. No one's going to go to the polls next year and vote for Labor because they're putting hate speech laws through. And and I think just uh, across the board, uh, people are wanting the government to get back to basics, to do the things that they said that they were going to do, and 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 let us continue on with the Kiwi way of life. And, and we know that Kiwis don't support the idea that the government should protect them uh, from speech or from ideas or from offence that they don't like. I think there's something actually very Kiwi about being allowed to be offended and, and being allowed to, to say something that has the potential of offending. Yeah. There's something Kiwi about saying, let's have this discussion. We might walk away disagreeing. And yeah. you know what? You are We're a wanker. Who shouters it? Generally, yeah. is how every every <laughs> uh, every argument in New Zealand should end. Uh, also, well, I'm sure Boise hears that all the time in the, in the pub, and, and there's something quite healthy about that. Frankly, I think there's something that's actually quite weird or creepy about this idea that we should all agree and that we should all get along like chums. You know, I'm, yeah. uh, social unity is, is important, but the idea that we all have to think the same, we all have to agree, and if not, we're, you know, perilously about to uh, start killing each other, I just, it, it, it's so farcical. Yeah. Boise, do you think uh, it is productive for Labor to say big banks bad, um, even though they're going to do nothing about it? I mean, during lockdown, mate, you had a tough time. I'm sure your bank helped you out to get through things, even though it was tough. don't know about my bank, but my business partner certainly did and does. Uh, this is the government, again, dividing uh, the country yeah. and marginalising segments and now it's the bank's turn and of course m m most people don't really like banks uh, they've got a function they've got to do it and if they don't make money well we're all broke too so th they, they are quite important but it, it's ongoing trend of this government to um, marginalise and divide or to and pick it, a target and turn everyone against it and say don't worry about what we've done wrong it's th those people over there it's their fault Delay, deny, denigrate all the time. Oh, that's harsh, Boise. That's really, really <laughs> harsh. Well, it's time to be harsh and we're still allowed to say things, you know. Like, are they going <laughs> to throw me in, in the gulag for this, yeah. you know? Like... <laughs> well, I'm sure, though, you are both really relieved, really relieved to hear that the Midwifery Council has removed the term mother and woman from their scope of 
practice guidelines for um, for midwives because they reflect a colonial past and they're not inclusive. That is an important thing that under this government has been achieved, isn't it, um, Jonathan? But these these are the big things that people get up in the morning worrying about. No, look, look, Sean, not, I don't think a single one of your listeners will be there thinking this is a logical, re- rational, reasonable step forward. Uh, and, and look, from the Free Speech Union perspective, actually, frankly, uh, they, they should have the right to do this. This is, this is them trying to represent their, their uh, workplace and that client. But what concerns me about this is the shutting down of conversations or really the expression of any sort of perspective that isn't in line with this very woke, very progressive way of thinking. Uh, we're we're going to see targets put on, on those that are resisting this very quickly. And we've, you know, about half the cases that the Free Speech Union has represented have come from the medical industry, nurses, uh, morticians, clinicians, uh, people in the DHB, who in this space for some reason, more so than most others, there's a real um, fixation on towing the line and not saying things that upset others. And so with this, when I saw this come out, I thought undoubtedly before too long, we'll have a couple of cases here where someone is just trying to say, no, actually, I serve women because women have children. And if you want to disagree with it, that's fine. Have the conversation, but don't try and shut someone down and, and, and don't you dare try and fire someone because we'll be on your backs pretty quickly yeah. if people want to continue to use these words. Alistair, isn't it better to live in a world where we we don't have to call people who have babies mothers and anyone uh, can have a baby? Isn't that the sort of utopia, socialist utopia we're aiming for? I don't know. I, I get very confused with all this. I, I think there's another angle on this is you've got a bloated um, state bureaucracy of people working from home and they've got nothing better to do than suck up to the government's woke agenda. To, to get brownie points and, and get another six thousand dollars a year in, in their in their pay packet, um, because the government loves them because they're telling them telling the lie and the line that that's required by this regime. Yeah. All right. Um, do you have? What do you do? What's your policy at the backbencher for your conveniences? For our toilets. Mm. Um, well, hopefully. I mean. Um, I'm, I'm all for diversity and I've got no problem with, um, uh, you know, trans people and blah, blah, blah. I, I have a problem with people under 18 um, do, do, doing things to their bodies. I think you've got to be an adult to make decisions. Um, as far as I... We've got the traditional old toilets where you've got male and female. Yeah, so <laughs> wacky it's, concept. It's all based on your, yeah, yeah, it's all based on your anatomy, unfortunately. So if your biology is that you're a man, well, please go to the male toilets. And if your biology says you're a woman, please go to the female Okay, toilet. but actually you are, it's, this is interesting, Boise. You're actually in a position where you might have to deal with this in real terms. So yeah. some bloke comes in dressed up like a Sheila. Yeah. But he's got all his tackle and he wants to use the Sheila's toilets and there's a Sheila in there and she takes offence. What do you do? Uh, well, I, I would um, uh, strongly recommend and, and mildly remonstrate, hopefully, with uh, the um, biological male to please, can you use the male toilet? And what if he female, said, but hang on, I am a woman. Yep. I feel like I'm a woman. Well, I'd, I'd just have to say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but <laughs> this is the reality. Uh, the, the majority of females uh, are, are in the female toilet with female anatomy. Um, it appears that you are biologically a male and they're not comfortable. So please desist from um, using the female toilet. It may be better if you left yeah. the premises that yeah, you don't like. You fascist. You yeah, absolute fascist. Uh, Jonathan... <laughs> It's ridiculous we're having that conversation, but it's a real conversation, isn't it? Well, look, Sean, I didn't actually know I was starting up for a conversation here with someone who was so hateful and, and, and someone whose views are so oppressive. So I think I've been blindsided. Actually. Yeah, that's but, right. Boy, he's, classic, is... he's your classic <laughs> post-colonial male chauvinist pig, though, mate. And I hear that he likes people with red hair and plaits and knows some people that knit. <laughs> <laughs> the pen, the pen is mightier than the sword. All right, Boise, it is what? nice to know w- what will happen to me next time I put a skirt on and go into the women's toilets at the back bench. I must say, uh, you've given well, me, ab- you've given me I'll absolute fair warning. Sean, I'll call you a perv and make sure you leave if you do that. All right. <laughs>
<laughs> but Sean, you know what I hear from from uh, Boise's comments there is actually a willingness to engage and to to try and have a dialogue and to convince people. And I think that's really the key element that so many of these um, statements, because they're not conversations, just these statements are: I am a woman, I'm a man. We're not allowed to use these terms. Look, society's changed, and I think we need to be up for that. Certainly, um, you know, the fact that a transgender can go into the the backbencher pub is something that I'm sure would have been different from other taverns in the area 60 years ago. But but what I hear him saying is, look, let me talk to you about this. Let me explain why you're making other people feel uncomfortable. And let's see if we can come up with a solution, not not at a national level, not across everyone, just, just what you and I are dealing with here. And I think that's the key aspect of what we're losing in our society. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. We don't need legislation for this. You've just got to be calm and reasonable. I mean, I love the diversity. I've got, um, I've got a trans working for me. I've got lesbians. Someone just sent I me a text. Someone just sent me a text, Boise, saying, "I think Boise has a transgender staff member." Well, so what? You got all sorts yeah, of do. staff members, and and, 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 I, and I love them to bits. But <laughs> you know, I love the Careful. diversity. Yeah, for you know, that's all good, but um, you do have to draw a line um, when you're dealing with the public and you don't have individual toilet cubicles that, are, that mm. anyone can have their privacy in, then you've got to sort of maintain a, a decorum and a, and a mm. fair practice. But the, the way it's heading is, you, you, if they carry on down this line, you'd have to have endless streams of individual toilet cubicles. Yeah. Um, and then it doesn't matter what sex you are. But um, yeah. So it, 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 that, that's the way it would head. But it's just getting over legislated. Look, you know, we've got a cost of living crisis. Um, everyone's doing it hard. Small business is the new working class. The rural sector is the new proletariat. And we've got a pretty uh, wealthy public sector, probably the new mm. bourgeoisie. I think we've got bigger problems than worrying about the toilets. Yeah, I, I hear you. Well, one big problem that I don't think is a big problem and increasingly reports suggest it isn't as so-called climate change what used to be global warming when those computer modelling things failed. And once again, people gathering at COP27 and the UN warning that we're at a tipping point the same way it did back in the year 2000 and that we've only got nine months to save the planet it all burn to a crisp. Yet in the last couple of days, people say, oh, things aren't warming up as quickly as we thought. Uh, what do we think of COP27, where all these leaders fly there on their planes, it's sponsored by Coca-Cola, and honestly seems to generate more hot air than uh, any number of cows in New Zealand, uh, Boise? Yeah, um, that piece I wrote the last time yeah. after I was so bewildered with the... Um with the Ardern government attack on the rural sector, again, marginalising and dividing out a, a, such an important part of our economy and our socio-economy. You, you, you can imagine the, uh, the police looking at that going, oh, my God, here we go, we've got another occupation protest emanating out of rural New Zealand, if you remember your survey results. Yep. They emanated out of uh, the towns and rural New Zealand. So they've been again uh, marginalised and inflamed. It, 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 could quite easily turn into a minor civil war. Well, civil careful, oh, we do not want to encourage that, Alice. Do we have a democ democracy that works? Yeah, well, we want to keep our democracy that works by um, pulling people back into the democracy instead of marginalising them out. Mm. Now, I see the UN have just come out and halved their yeah. um, forecast uh, for... Um, Global you know, warming? The, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's been halved now. I mean... I, I, Let's I'm, all go home. They can all go home from COP27, can't they, Jonathan? It's not as bad as we thought. <laughs> well, look, this is the, the nature of knowledge. It evolves from one situation to the next. We learn something new and things change. And so I, I think this is comparable to a number of big crisis scenarios that were faced recently. We, we take proactive action and, and good on them for that because you work with the knowledge you have. You work yeah. with the understanding you have. But as it changes, calls me old-fashioned, but I think it takes just a little bit of leadership to say, hey, look, this is what we knew then, and this is what we know now, and it's not as bad as we thought. And you, I think there are some comparisons to a number of other situations as well where they, they took extreme steps. We learn things because we engage in speech, we engage in conversations, we keep challenging each other's ideas. And that is how knowledge develops. And then we learn things and things progress. And so now, if it, 
I'm, I'm not saying, oh, good, we can all pack up and go home, because, you know, th there are probably... Still but, I mean, honestly, we much, can abandon this ridiculous carbon neutral by 2050 rubbish. Yeah, Again, just from, yeah. from, a, from a leadership perspective, hysteria has never served any situation well. Hysteria shuts down conversations, and it means anyone with a dissenting view is excluded. Just like Boyd is saying there, for the sake of our democracy, we cannot keep pushing people to the margin simply because they disagree with us, or simply because they have a perspective that we believe counters our widely held view. And, and now we're seeing in a couple of situations that actually... People contributing dissenting opinions is crucial. And so we need to draw people back into that conversation. It's so difficult, though. You know, do you believe this about the vaccines and COVID? That all the anti-vaccine nutters are, are real? Are they going to be all proved right one day? I think we continue to learn new things about COVID and we continue to learn new things about the vaccine because <laughs> people contribute. Now, now, absolutely, there are some cranks and nutters out there. We've yeah. been very clear about that. Mm. But... Do I think they should be shut down? Do I think they, 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 they should be criminalised for misinformation? Mm. Absolutely not. Because not only do I think that's unproductive in dealing with their conspiracy theories, because that's what many of them are, but it's also, we cut ourselves off from the fact that they're probably 99% wrong, but maybe that 1% is something we need to learn from. Yeah, well, I see Queensland today, Boise, is warning that they, they might go back into amber or some sort of lockdown. I reckon that is a situation to watch. I wonder if Queensland will comply. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if most people just didn't didn't go along with it. I mean, and this has always been um, part of the fear factor. Just getting back to this um, climate change thing and the reaction to it. I mean, the ridiculousness and the idi idiocy of some of the reactions New Zealand are doing, like carving the, the rural sector um, out with their 20%. Yeah. Um, but this pine forest thing is ridiculous. So um, there's people making huge amounts of money by buying up New Zealand land, especially in the high countries, and planting these pine forests. That They suck out more water than farming, and way more of water, obviously, than the natural environment. So um, I'm a a bit of a hunter and I really enjoy the natural environment um, and I really don't want to see sort of one third of New Zealand turned into forestry and pine forestry and then we need more electricity so what do the, these pine forests do they suck out the water and that doesn't go down to the catchments or the high we need more hydro or we need to look at nuclear energy if we want to seriously deal with the carbon emissions it's not all about farmers and animals I go hunting I don't know if you realize how many animals are in the hills and I think they've all got the same bowels as cows um, there are <laughs> hundreds hundreds of thousands of deer goats and pigs all through the hills of New Zealand what are they doing about that why are the farmers copying it when they're, when they're um, producing food for the world efficiently and they're already changing and changing you quickly? Should get, you should get a carbon credit every time you drop a red deer, shouldn't you, Boise? Exactly. Well, I mean, this is the point. I mean, <laughs> this carbon trading scheme, I, I sort of seriously, I have serious doubts about the whole thing. I think someone sussed it out. Obviously, John Key sussed it out. He was bloody good at trading, wasn't he? Yeah. So what he did in uh, the 2015, 2016, instead of having to sort of deal with the emissions, they did the trading thing. So countries can delay m making action, but we've got to review the actual actions we're taking. I mean, I'm all about conservation and other aspects of conservation and, and maintaining the environment and maintaining our ecosystem. It's not all about carbon, you know? Yeah. This fixation on a, a global warming, and it's just been sort of half debunked by yeah, the well, I, I think and, I think that particular conspiracy theory, uh, the climate change conspiracy theory, is going to collapse relatively quickly. Guys, can I just say we've had lovely feedback to you too. These blokes nailed it on all levels, 100% awesome panel this morning. But then again, this from Dean, effing hypocrites. Um, so, so you take uh, the rough with the smooth. Uh, Jonathan, I hope we can have you back and that you enjoyed um, uh, the format of Free Speech Fridays. Absolutely. Look, look Sean, you know, there, there are many conversations that you and I had. We agree on something. We disagree on others. But the key point is that we're able to actually have that have the conversation. Actually, I, 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 I think I think uh, a Boise has been a good contributor here. You should give him a show, but uh, you know, very keen to sit down again. And Boise, if you right. get invaded by transgender people wanting to use your toilets, I'm sorry, it wasn't my fault.
Oh, well, I mean, I'm sure. Well, I've got another plan. So um, we'll just open up, salivate the cafe next door and make that a transgender toilet in there when, when, uh, for the pub. <laughs> I don't know. You can work your way around it, you know. Like, it, it's, it's a big beat-up, for God's sake. All know? right, Boise. Uh, good to talk to you again. We'll have you back as well. That is Alistair Boyce and Jonathan Ayling, our panel for Free Speech Fridays.